Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Snydacker, and I'm co-chair of the uh, Education Committee at the Toro Synagogue Foundation. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the second session of the winter 2022-2023 season of the Judah Toro Program Series, which is a presentation of the Toro Synagogue Foundation. First, thanks to everyone who's made this series possible, including Meryl Cauley, Laura Pedrick, Ann Arnold, Emily Grigori, and the other members of the Adult Education Committee, Shirley Saunders, Sam Shamoon, Donna Podrat, and Emily Colbert Cairn. This series of diverse programs seeks to connect the history of Toro Synagogue to important themes in American history, to develop a more relevant and sophisticated voice for that history, and bring it to the wide and inclusive audience as possible. Tonight, we will feature a remarkable examination of the architecture and meaning of the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, or the Esnoga, as it is known in Judeo-Spanish, or Ladino, the traditional language of Sephardic Jews. We began this season last month with a presentation by Paul Finkelman uh, that addressed one of the most compelling and difficult issues uh, in the history of Toro Synagogue, and in fact, the entire Atlantic world, Jews, slavery, and the meaning of freedom. With tonight's presentation, we will turn to Amsterdam, which was the Dutch city that became an epicenter for a new version of Western Sephardic or Spanish and Portuguese Jewish culture, architecture, and religious practice, all of which had a strong influence on Newport's first Jewish settlers uh, who arrived here in the late 17th and early 18th century. On February 9th, 2023 at 6 p.m., um, we will meet with Samantha Baskin, a uh, distinguished professor of art and history at Cleveland State University, who will give an illustrated talk titled Picturing Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews in 17th and 18th century Amsterdam, using the works of artists such as Rembrandt and Picard and others. The kind of the signature image for that talk is a um, is a drawing that that Rembrandt did of Manasseh ben Israel, one of the the, the leaders of um, of Sephardic Jewry at that point. On March thirtieth, twenty twenty three, at noon, we will close this season's programs and return to Newport for a collaborative presentation hosted by the Rhode Island School of Design Museum and their ongoing program titled Local Collections in Conversations. It will feature Toro Synagogue's Ner Tamid, our eternal light that hangs in front of the, uh, in front of the ark, um, and the great chandelier, which is just located just behind there, uh, along with comparable objects from the collection of the RISD Museum. It will be a very interesting dialogue about those objects. Uh, presenters will include Howard Newman, our own Howard Newman, a nationally respected Newport artist and conservator who restored both of those objects in a recent uh, restoration of the building. All of these programs are being recorded and will be posted to the foundation's website where they can be viewed in full at any time. We're in, the, in, this, in this series, we're building a wonderful archive of historical material. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Peter Verdingerbrook, one of the real um, experts on, on, on the Netherlands architectural history. It's a pleasure to have him and an honor to have him here with us tonight. Dr. Verdingerbrook works as an architectural historian for the City Council of Amsterdam, and he makes historical assessments of listed buildings, mainly focusing on buildings of the 17th century. He's also the author or editor of a number of books about important buildings and sites, such as the Portuguese Synagogue. Um, his, his volume on, on the Esnoga is the definitive work, but also he's worked on the Amsterdam Ring of Canals, now a World Heritage Site. Peter's doctoral dissertation was on the Amsterdam, Amsterdam Town Hall, now the Royal Palace which is the most monumental example of Dutch architecture of the 17th century. Until recently, Peter was also teaching at Utrecht University and is now a guest researcher. 
Um, he chairs the committee for architectural drawings at the Dutch Royal Antiquarian Society based at the Ertz Museum. Um, and uh, Peter's analysis of the selection of the architect and his design for the Asnoga can shed valuable light on the likely process followed by Jews here in Newport, but also in London and New York, as they made choices about their own architects and architectural styles as they built their own synagogues. It dem demonstrates how important the continued link to Amsterdam was for Newport Jews as they forged a new identity for themselves in a new culture in the English empire, but worked to keep connections with the traditions and practices of Western Sephardic architecture. So, ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure then to give you Dr. Peter Rerdingerbrook. Peter. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, shall I start sharing my screen? Yes, I think. Is it visible for everyone? Yes. Great. Good. Well, thank you very much, Dan, and everybody uh, present for having me uh, over, for inviting me to give this uh, small talk about um, the Portuguese synagogue or Snoga in Amsterdam. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for, for me to say something about the building, and I'll try to um, to divide it in three parts, uh, three elements, um, which are the people, um, which is the city of Amsterdam, and which is the building itself. Um, but also for other reasons, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, to, to get this opportunity to say something about, um, the, the Amsterdam situation. Um, and I didn't know that before, actually, that was a friendly communication of, um, uh, Ton, uh, Thiele. This is a most wonderful building. So I would like to congratulate you with this most beautiful building. Um, and personally, if I compare it to other synagogue architecture in England, for example, like Beavis Marks, I I find it a truly beautiful and um, yeah, well designed building. So, um, um, and I I didn't know about this before, but it perfectly underlines the importance which Amsterdam actually had for Turo, for the Turo synagogue in Newport. Uh, and another thing which I didn't know, and that's uh, the communication which was done to me by Ton Thielen. Um, I didn't know actually at the beginning that Turo was the the, the cantor or the chazan of <clears throat> your synagogue, um, but that he actually came from Amsterdam and that there was even um, um, a request from the Panasim, from the board from um, Newport, to... Um, to send over from Amsterdam a cantor to Newport. And they held a competition, and this competition had a winner. And this is your Isaac de Abraham Turo, who was the cantor uh, who left uh, for Newport. And that's interesting to know, of course, that there were close relationships between Amsterdam at the one side and Newport at the other side. And this was in 1759, um, actually during the construction of your building. Another thing which he also uh, communicated to me was the fact that in 1760, Amsterdam sent to Newport on Rhode Island, you can see it on the, the red underlined uh, uh, sections of the text, they send a Sefer Torah to, uh, to Newport, so they send a Torah scroll to Newport to start uh, to, or to, 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 to celebrate the beginning of uh of the, the 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 congregation in newport in this new building it, of course it existed before but to to mark the beginning of the building they send also the sefer torah so it's very interesting to see and it underlines my idea uh which was actually the title of the lecture uh, as amsterdam as the kind of and the snog as as as, as the well cathedral, I, I shouldn't use, of course, the word cathedral, but all, as some kind of a cathedral, a, a Sephardic cathedral of the Western Hemisphere, uh, and it underlines the influence Amsterdam had on the cultural, uh, on the Sephardic uh, history of the Western Hemisphere. So it's very interesting to see, uh, again, another proof of this connection between. Um, Amsterdam at the one side and uh, and America on the other side. So I knew the, about the, the connections between Amsterdam and London, but this is an, a wonderful addition to 
this whole idea of the role of Amsterdam. So far, so good. Um, and another thing, uh, which of course is very important in the Torah synagogue uh, and, and the Jewish history in Newport, um, is um, Washington. And I thought uh, every lecture in America deserves a bit of Washington, uh, especially uh, since I have a good friend who might be listening from Mount Vernon, um, so I couldn't omit uh, Washington. And especially the letter Washington wrote to the congreg congregation in Newport. And um, the, the letter is, um, uh, you can see the letter on the right in the text, and especially the section that all possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. Now, this is, of course, very interesting that the Jews in Newport were seen as full citizens, not half citizens, but they really belonged there and they had this liberty of conscience. And that, again, is another link between Newport and Holland. Um, so now we go over to Holland and I'll try to explain you the link. Um, this is um, this is a map which I would like to show you first, a 16th, 17th century map of, of Holland, or I, sh I should say the Low Countries better. Um, on the top, uh, you see the, the, the present day Holland and the southern part of the line, actually the body of the line itself, that's present day Belgium. And it was to these low countries where many Jews were coming. Um, and they were coming here uh, because this freedom of, freedom of conscience, which was talked about by Washington, already existed in Holland uh, or in the northern part of Holland, uh, of, of the Netherlands, since 1579. So during this, uh, we had this, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether you all know this, we had this in Holland, we had this uprise against the Spaniards. Uh, so we we, we uh, got rid of the, the King Philip II, the son of Charles V. The, the um, and there was this new union, this, this, this actually this, this rogue re republic, this, this villains who, 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 who um, deposed of the king and they said, go away, um, created a new country, a republic, which was, very uh, special, of course, in, in the 16th century, not many republics existed at, at the time. Um, but one of the essential things of this new country, which they tried to establish, this, this, this Netherlands, this, this, um, this, this new country, was to have freedom of conscience, so that all Catholics, all Protestants, and everyone was allowed to think what they were wanted to think. That is essential to Dutch um, uh, to the Dutch Republic, and that's essential to our way of living, and that's what we still try to be. Um, uh, present day, we all try to leave each other in their own value, um, and uh, have uh, let all people um, uh, profess their uh, religions as they want to. So that's very new, of course, because the Spaniards uh, before were trying to uh, suppress Protestantism. And there were um, uh, many of the Protestants were uh, killed on the fire, uh, on fire stakes. So this freedom of conscience, which Washington talked about, was also the freedom of conscience in the Netherlands in the 16th, 17th century. And that was very important for the Sephardic Jews. So the Sephardic Jews coming from Spain and Portugal, um, which actually were there until were living freely on the on the the Spanish um, uh, and and Portuguese regions until 1492. Um, um, they needed a place to go to because since 1492, uh, the Spaniards uh, the, the were um, uh, the Jew, Jews were not were not allowed their freedom anymore to profess their religion in Spain. So they were expelled from Spain, or they should. Um, be baptized and be new Christians. And in Spain, these new Christians were called conversos, the ones who converted to, to Christianity, or called the Maranos, uh, which was the, their, their not-so-friendly nickname, the, the pigs, uh, as it's called, the Maranos. And many of the Jews who didn't want to be, be, uh, be, be Christian, they went to Portugal. But during the 16th century, uh, the Jews were again uh, prosecuted both in Spain and Portugal, and even the ones who were converted to Christianity were suspect of being crypto Jews and um, more or less kicked out of the country or um, wanted to leave the country. 
And that caused many Jews, of course, to leave, many Jews leaving to Morocco, to Italy, to, 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 to Turkey, but a big part also left for Antwerp in the beginning. So in the 16th century, many of the Portuguese and Spanish Jews, are, I will just say Portuguese Jews, but I mean the Jews from all Spain and Portugal, they all went to, uh, a certain part went to Antwerp, which was the, the, the main capital, the metropole, the, the metropolis of, of the northern uh, part of Europe with a lot of um, trade. But Antwerp was a part of the southern Netherlands, Belgium, uh, and in 1585, the Spaniards took back Belgium, uh, took back Antwerp, uh, and Antwerp became Catholic again. So the Jews were not safe in Antwerp anymore, anymore, causing them to leave to Rotterdam and later on Amsterdam. So that's how many of the Sephardic Jews uh, in the 17th century end up in Amsterdam, because they were driven away first from Spain and later on from Antwerp. It's a minute. Yeah, it's working. So this is where they were leaving for. This is where they went. They went to Amsterdam, and this is a ground plan of the city of Amsterdam. And Amsterdam in the early 17th century, when many of the Portuguese Jews were coming, was a growing city. Um, in the 16th century, it was a rather small city. But with uh, the fall of Antwerp, when it went uh, became Spanish again, Amsterdam was growing and growing and expanding and expanding. And that, in, in the end, it took over the role of Antwerp as the, 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 the commercial metropole of um, uh, Europe. And this is the city we, we know. This is the growing city in which many of the Jews were uh, uh, finally uh, going to live. Um, and I'm not sure whether you can see. No, you, I can't point it out, unfortunately, with my mouse. So there were, and, and the Jews, many of the Jews were going to the, to the part which is on the left of the map. You see, you see on the left, you see this, this, this river running through the city and running out of the city. And there's this rectangular um, island where many of the Jews were going. But these Jews who came to Amsterdam, these Sephardic Jews, what were they exactly? Because... Um, we tend to think, of course, looking back, that they were all Jewish and they were all Sephardi and they were religious and 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 um, no doubt about that. But the 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 thing is, that's a little bit more complex. So what we see is a large group of Portuguese Jews coming there. Part of them still remained Christian, and a part of them never reconverted back to Judaism. A part of them wanted to. Be, uh, be Jews again and really profess the Jewish faith. But of course, they had a small problem. For in Spain and in Portugal, they were not allowed to profess their faith. So they had to be taught again how what were the ways of Judaism. And they imported a, a rabbi from Emden, uh, an Ashkenazi rabbi, to teach them how to be Jewish again. At the same time, they took a lot of valuable things from Portugal and Spain with them. And one of the most prized possessions of uh, the, the Sephardic Jews in Amsterdam is this silver dish, which was made in Portugal in the 16th century. And it perfectly illustrates the importance of um, their, actually their, their, their Catholic way of living in the 16th century. Because what we see, even though this is one of the main uh, objects of Amsterdam, we see um, um, a frieze with a hunt. And on the frieze, the, we see the boar's hunt. So very strange. In a synagogue, one of the most prized possessions, we see uh, a frieze depicting the boar's hunt, which is, of course, amazing, especially if you understand, if you realize that this dish was put on big festive days uh, in the synagogue itself. So you get a double thing, which is kind of amazing. You see this beautiful piece of silver, very elaborately done. You see all these images and pictures uh, which are depicted here, um, which might go against the, the idea that you shouldn't um, have images in a synagogue itself. And uh, of course, the fact that you have a boar is, is completely, um, well, 
strange, of course. You wouldn't, ex you would never expect a boar, a swine, a pig to be in a synagogue. But in Amsterdam, they did. And I show you this to 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 make you understand the 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 the, the diverse culture they are in. It's not pure um, uh, a pure Judaism. It's actually a mix of the international top layer knowing what quality was in the arts and everything, and people trying to relearn how to be Jewish. Um, and the Portuguese Jews, they were one well, of the most amazing merchants and had contacts all over the world. So that, that is why we in Holland uh, sometimes still indicate the Sephardi Jews as the, well, not the big Jews, but the, the really the, the, the more... Um, the top layer of Jews, where the Ashkenazi Jews were actually the 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 well a bit kind of lesser kind of Jews. Um, it's of course um, probably I'm, I'm not I'm not, I'm not explaining it very well because I'm, I'm Dutch, so I have to look for the right words in English. But what I mean is that the Sephardic Jews felt actually felt superior to the Ashkenazi Jews in the 17th century. Um, but these Jews coming to Amsterdam, they had to learn their Judaism. And they were doing all the things which were need to be, needed to be done. And one of them was to find, of course, um, a beautiful a, a place to, to, to bury the dead. And it's still there, the most beautiful cemetery. Um, one of the most beautiful Jewish cemeteries, actually, I think, uh, which exists certainly in, in, in Holland, in Beth Chaim, uh, where you find all the tombstones of, of um, Sephardi Jews beginning in 1614. Um, partially, uh, part of these tombstones is overgrown with grass, but it gives a wonderful, beautiful, natural atmosphere to this um, cemetery. But already in 1614, with these lovely stones, these these shapes, you see these tombs, which remember, um, which if if you ever been to Morocco, they have the same kind of shape. So this is kind of a really Sephardi way of uh, burying people. Being Jewish, of course, always also meant to to have uh, synagogues, and um, um, well, it's it's a, maybe a bit like Protestants. Uh, Protestants t tend to make um, one church, uh, so one person is a, is a is a person, two person is a church, and three people is two churches. But you get a church division, uh, and a bit of the same happened with the Jews, uh, with the Portuguese Jews. There were three different um three different congregations which couldn't get along very well so they were uh, they, were, they constantly had fights or, and one ex um had its origins in another synagogue and there's a constantly split off but in 1639 they decided it should be different because you get all this 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 splintering of the different uh, synagogues and you would like to have one big synagogue where you unite all the people and where you also have, as as a Portuguese Jew, a strong hold uh, and and a clear um, um, concentration of power, and that's also given in by the fact that it's also because of the fact that many in this time many Ashkenazi Jews uh, came to Amsterdam as well, and um, there was a rather strict division between the Sephardi Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews, and the Ashkenazi Jews wanted to well be. Um, together again and to, to show some kind of unity. So that's why in 1639, the three synagogues went to get, well, merged into one, uh, forming the Talmud Torah uh, congregation. And they um, um, had their synagogue on uh, what is indicated by the number three. And what is did what what did this synagogue look like? And this is an image uh, of the old synagogue, uh, not the present day, but the old synagogue from 1639. And what we see is um, a building, which um, it has a kind of a strange structure. Um, it's not really a large building, and that's because of the fact that, despite the fact that we had uh, freedom of conscience. The different religions were not allowed to make uh, enormous buildings. So what we see is that the Protestants were allowed to make churches, which were visible from the streets. But the Jews, the Lutherans, the Catholics, all the others were not allowed uh, large visible churches. So their churches had to be hidden in a way. 
So what you see is these kind of structures in which uh, warehouses or mansions were rebuilt or changed or altered to make a, rather, a bit of a larger space in order to have a, a, well, a kind of a religious uh, building uh, like churches or synagogues. And this is this 13, uh, 1639 synagogue. And what we see is the typical Sephardi way of um, uh, of 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 um, of, of the, the, the typical Sephardi ground plan for a synagogue, in which you have the the bima, which is actually called a, um, a teba in in the, the Sephardi synagogue, and the ark, which is actually called the hechal, and they're both on opposite end of the synagogue. Um, that's different from the most Ashkenazi synagogues, where the the the, the bima is usually in the middle. Um, the way the synagogue was made is rather similar to other denominations like the Catholic Church, uh, and I show you an, uh, an image of a Catholic hidden church. So this is how the Catholics were were, were going to church, and this is how the, uh, the the Portuguese Jews were going to synagogue. So you see a rather similar thing, uh, a similar structure, um, but from the outside you couldn't see. This is the most important example, 1662, Our Lord in the Attic. And what we see is a kind of a warehouse, a partially house warehouse, in the, in which the priest was living on the down on, on the lower floors, and on the top floor, so really the top part of the building, there would be the church. Sixteen sixty two. Remember the date, sixteen sixty two. And this is a church. Um, so what you do is you you have these joists running from one wall to the other. And you just just cut them off and then make this this kind of a vida this 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 higher room and this serves as a church so, so you're partly in the roof structure of the building so this is the 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 situation which was there for the um for the for the for the catholics and for all the other denominations and for the jews and this is how the protestants were building so they were, had this really open visible churches and especially, of course, a tower. So the, the Protestants, the Calvinists, actually only the Calvinists, only they were allowed to have these beautiful, uh, these, these, these large tower structures. They were allowed to make these churches which were really visible as churches and recognizable as such. So church architecture is only for Protestant churches. And even the Lutherans, although they were allowed to have this rather monumental uh, church, in 1668, they were not allowed to have rounded windows. So everything, it, it, it is a church. It is obvious that it's a monumental thing. It's a Lutheran church. So it's 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 a, the, the, the Protestant brethren of the, the, the Calvinist, but still they were not allowed a tower. And by looking at all that, and by looking at all these Catholic uh, hidden churches, it's rather amazing that in 1670, um, the city granted permission to the Ashkenazi Jews to build a synagogue like this, very clearly visible from the outside, very noticeable there, very much in the, in the style of the 1760s, even probably done by the city architect. So they were even helping the Jews to make a rather beautiful synagogue and a very um, distinctly visible and that is, of course, very interesting for, for, for uh, I find, within our culture, um, that we, um, that, that the, 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 the Protestant city government of Amsterdam allowed the Jews to have these important buildings which were so visible, while the Catholics were still um, uh, pressed to, to stay in these hidden churches. And it shows that actually the, the, the Jews had a better position than the Catholics in Amsterdam. What, what I said is, of course, that the Ashkenazi Jews were having this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful synagogue. Um, but the Portuguese synagogue always, uh, the Portuguese felt themselves a bit, actually a bit, well, um, they, they thought themselves a bit higher, a bit better than the, the Ashkenazi Jews. So what they did is they couldn't stay behind. And the first thing they did when, they, when the, 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 the great shul was, 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 was built, to ask at the city government whether there was a spot they could buy and to make a new synagogue because the former synagogue was too small and they had to make a new one. 
And what we see here is, is the, the ground plan of Amsterdam in 1662. You see a large portion of the city being white. Uh, this is a, the, what we call the fourth extension of the city. And one of these buildings blocks was taken, uh, was bought by the, by the, uh, the, the, the Sephardi congregation to make a new uh, synagogue. And they bought this complete building block, um, uh, which you see here. You see the, you see different blocks inscribed. You see this square in a bit in the middle, uh, which is the, the 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 Ashkenazi synagogue. And on the right, where you see the text, the whole this whole part was bought by the Portuguese Jews to make this well this new building, which was to to really outdo the the Ashkenazi one which should be really a wonderful, great building uh, and which was to underline their status, their importance for the city of Amsterdam. And another good thing about this building plot, building lot is that it was directed towards Jerusalem, which is ideal, of course, for a synagogue. Let me see. And this is the design. Unfortunately, I can't show the, you the original designs for the synagogue itself because they were not kept. Uh, this is one of the things we have. But we know that in 1671, um, Elias Baumann, Master Mason, designed uh, this synagogue for the Sephardi. And um, he, he was uh, allowed to make this beautiful structure, which is 100 by 125 feet. Um, it should be in the best of uh, fashion of, of, of the, the time itself. It should be beautiful. And th there was another uh, one last thing the, 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 the Parnassim, the board of the Portuguese synagogue asked for, is that in the inside there would be a barrel vault. So this is a, a bit more of the design of, of, of the, the, the synagogue in which you can clearly see that the synagogue building is the large structure in the middle. The structure is surrounded by smaller buildings, and in these smaller buildings, all the other functions are are being placed. So, at the one hand, you see you have the the sextons who were living there, and on the on the other hand, you have the the cantors who, who were giving were given were given a house in these surrounding buildings. At the same time, there was a, a library and a madrash, uh, um, and a, a school, and of course, there was a gallery to wash. So this is the general idea of the synagogue, which was built in 1675. You can see on the ground plan on the top where all these functions were uh, done. And again, here you see the, 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 the layout of the whole complex with the surrounding buildings and the synagogue in the middle. And th that had the great advantage of, of the people of the, uh, going to, to synagogue to walk around the, church, the, 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 the synagogue itself after their services. And for the people going to the children of the school to 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 stay in in the the area of um, of the synagogue itself, so you you would really create this 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 Portuguese zone in which the children were safe and the the the, the elderly people the el older people were feeling uh, that they were in it, in their own uh, area. And this is how it looks like this rather large brick structure um, with the surrounding building. Um, I'll just show you some pictures so you, I can give you a bit of an image of how, what it looks like. Uh, this is how it looks like from the side. And here you see that it is a rather large structure, which is um, um, well, much larger than its surrounding buildings. And that is one of the uh, rules which came from the, Jew, the, the Jewish laws, the halakha. It needed, the synagogue itself needed to be actually the most impressive or at least the highest in the neighborhood, the highest building. Um, this is how the building looks from the inside. Uh, according to the building regulations the Parnassim gave with this barrel vault, because I thought if you have this barrel vault, this round vault, then the, the singer, the cantor, will um, have a better sound and it will be better audible in the whole the space, in the whole space. Um, this doesn't serve any function just for its beauty because it's still a 
beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, building with a beautiful atmosphere. And one of the most gorgeous things is that it still has no electricity. So the lighting, which you see, is all candle lit. Everything is, is uh, it's, it's still without heating and without um, electricity. So if, you, if you're there in the winter, it's, it's, it's excruciatingly cold. But it's um it's it's a great um, experience to be there, even in winter. The internal section of the the building, the ground plan is is as it should be. It's copying the the ground plan of the old synagogue, um, uh, which I showed you before. Uh, on the one side you see the hechal, and on the other side you see the teba, the the bima. Um, both on opposite sides of um, of the, the the space, and in between you see the benches where the people were sitting, and of course on the outside, on the in in the side aisles you see them the 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 galleries on smaller columns, and those were the women's galleries. Um, and here a most beautiful picture of one of the Torah scrolls in use with a, a little top of the the rimonim the 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 tower the the the, the the ornaments on top of the Torah scroll, but then the, the lighter variant, and on the right where the Torah scrolls were, uh, are still being kept in the Hechal, with its gilt leather and the, the Torah scrolls uh, in, in, the, in the cupboard itself. And actually this is already in the 18th century, was kind of rebuilt into a kind of safe, so all the doors are iron plated. There's a, there's a, there's a big plate of iron inside all these doors, uh, enable um, to 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 secure the treasures of the Portuguese synagogue, which were inside. Mm. So this is the building. This is the building as depicted by Gerrit Bergheide in 1675. And here you see most clearly the difference between at the left, the Ashkenazi synagogue, and at the right, the Sephardi synagogue, which is far bigger which is four times as big um, and which is very clearly visible from the, from the street, really um, underlining the, 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 st the, the status the, the Portuguese Jews had in the, in the city. And if you compare that to other architecture, it is rather similar to the most Protestant churches we have in our country. Um, because of what I'm trying to, to, to show you now is to, to see where did the the or what, what is the origin of the design of this building where does it come from is it comparable to anything else um, and what are the sources for the design and if we look at religious architecture in the 17th century and especially the Calvinist architecture we see this kind of buildings uh, this is 1645 the Nieuwe Kerk the new church in Haarlem uh, built um, by the architect Jacob van Kampen, uh, our uh, star architect of the 17th century, who also in, uh, um, designed the town hall in Amsterdam, the Royal Palace. Um, and what we see here is a rather austere kind of architecture, brick, round windows, uh, cornice on top. But if you look closely, you see that at the, the, the you see these 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 buttresses, so these elements, these 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 walls on the, on the corners, and you see they're curved outwardly. Uh, so there's a small curve in these buttresses outward, and that is a kind of a strange thing to see. But actually, here you see it better. So you see these 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 uh, elements, these buttresses coming forward, as if there's a, a line. Um, and this is a rather typical element of church architecture in, in Holland in the 17th century. And we also see it in this church, uh, the Oosterkerk, the Eastern Church in Amsterdam. And here again, on the right, you see detail of the architecture with these buttresses uh, coming outward. And that's rather typical of architecture. And what is it? Uh, why did people do that? And actually, this is done the master mason of this church is the same as the architect of the portuguese synagogue so what is the meaning of that and especially if we look at that for the synagogue itself we see exactly the same so if we see that we see the, the the facade here and if we zoom in you see that these buttresses are curving outward what does it mean why is it there 
but first of all, we see, of course, that there's this link between the Protestant church architecture and the uh, Sephardi synagogue. It's the Snoga is is as it's almost it could have if if it had a tower, it would have been a church. Um, so it's very similar to church architecture, to Protestant church architecture of the 17th century. And these are these these buttresses, these are typical for the architecture of the 17th century, because in Holland and also in Spain, actually all over Europe, everybody was looking for the true origin of architecture. Where did the architecture come from? And um, everybody was busy trying to reconstruct buildings, important buildings like the temple. But the most important, actually, uh, reconstruction of the temple was in 1604, done by a Spaniard, uh, a Spanish Jesuit, Juan Bautista Villapando. And everybody was looking for the true origin of architecture, and he had the or he had the answer to everything. <laughs> so what did Philopando say? Philopando said, the temple of Jerusalem is the example of Greek and Roman architecture. Actually, Greek and Ar Roman architecture, Vitruvius, all the classical architecture, it all derives from the temple. And the beautiful thing of it, uh, of, co of course, historically seen, is it's, it's, it's nonsense, but that's his theory. And his theory was believed, uh, many people believed his theory in the 17th century, among which Jakob van Kampen, the architect. And the great advantage of having the temple as the primary source of perfect architecture, of classical architecture, is that it has a divine origin. So the temple in itself is perfect. And this is the temple, as this, as uh, as done by Villa Pando. And if you look at the temple mount, so on top you see this this beautiful, this 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 elaborately detailed architecture with all these pillars, there's in columns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Below you see this enormous substructure, which is the temple mount. And if you look at the temple mount, you see almost a kind of a similar architecture to the Portuguese synagogue. Um, here I show it again to show it next to each other. Of course, it's different, but you see all these rounded windows with the synagogue. You see these rounded windows in these niches of the Temple Mount. You see these buttresses curving outward. You see that in the Portuguese synagogue as well. So this is, for, for many people, for many architects, it refers to the Temple, or actually it refers to the Temple Mount. And that is for the for for Christian architecture interesting to refer to the Temple Mount and not to the Temple because for Christians, the Temple didn't exist anymore. That that's the the new Temple is Christ, and for Jews it's interesting to to refer to the Temple Mount to refer to lost Temple. So that's what's happened. And this interest in the Temple of Jerusalem was 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 really very important in the 17th century and we know of many uh, jews working together with uh, christian scientists and together they were they were, were were talking about the temple um so the main thing about this this complete importance of the temple of jerusalem for dutch 17th century architecture also has a theological reason because many people in the 1630s started to study in holland the temple of jerusalem because they thought, and which is a rather funny thought, but this is what they thought. They thought they the, the Christians believed that um, um, that in order for for Jesus Christ to come back as the Messiah, the Jews had to be had to convert to Christianity. So what happened was that they started dialogues with Manasseh ben Israel or with Yehuda Leon, and they were learning the Hebrew. And together with uh, the Jewish scholars, they were trying to think uh, of a common ground they could study together. And one of them was the temple. So this Yehuda Leon was 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 teaching them Hebrew and teaching them how the temple was would looking like. And they had the idea um, to reconstruct all the biblical architecture. And in the end, they had the idea, which is um, they tried actually to make this compromise between Jews and Christian that. The, the 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 return of Jesus Christ as uh, their Messiah could count as the the first coming of the first Messiah uh, Messiah of for the Jews, 
very strange idea, but that's what they thought. And that's why they collaborated on uh, architecture. And that's why they had the, all these theological uh, discourses of which the temple of Jerusalem was the most important. So that's that's a bit of the cultural world in Amsterdam which took place. And it also shows the, the uh, it underlines again um, the, 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 the openness of thinking uh, the Jews had in the 17th century, the, the Sephardi Jews had towards also Christian thinking. And here again, you see the, the images and you see how much the, the temple resembles um, the Portuguese synagogue in a way, so especially the Temple Mount. Um, let me see. Ah, yeah, I've spoken long enough. Um, so what what we see is, is is this beautiful building in Amsterdam, inspired by uh, by, by by the Temple of Jerusalem, especially the Temple Mount. This 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 dialogue between Christians and Jews. The use of uh, a, a, a Dutch architect to invent something which looks like a church. Um, so it's very uh, the, the the cultural um, material culture of the, the the Sephardi Jews was very much in Holland like the Dutch uh, culture, and we see that not only in um, the building itself but also in the artifacts. Um, and I show you some beautiful artifacts, uh, some highlights of. Um, of, of the treasury of, of the Portuguese synagogue with this beautiful golden um, a dish uh, filled with people and uh, with, with women, with men. Uh, I show you the Torah scrolls with the faisas, the, 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 the covers on it, and the rimonim and the the, 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 the crowns. The, the, the... It all shows the culture as it was in Holland in the 17th century, transported into the synagogue because that is what they what what the material culture of the portuguese jews is the very best of dutch culture we have because they were looking for the best and richest and most beautiful things and that's so great about uh the portuguese synagogue as it is now because there are artifacts over there which are completely unique in holland for instance this bench in 1742 when the fashion turned to france uh this um Chatanim bench was uh, was bought and given to the Portuguese synagogue and it has still has the most exquisite beautiful Obisson tapestries on top of it and it's the most modern kind of bench uh, Rococo bench from France imported into Holland and there's nothing similar to that so what you see is that all the culture that that they they amassed and I show you um, a small part of the treasury. You see all the rimonim and the, 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 the and another dish. Um, it's an enormous wealth of the best quality of silver and of silks and of brocade and everything. Um, this is just to give you some image of all the treasures that are still present in uh, the Portuguese synagogue. Mm. And but the most, what well, the thing I like best about all that is that even though um, it's it's being shown in these in, the, in these in these um, vitrines like this, it still can all be used. So all the things are still in use by the Portuguese congregation until now. So what you see, uh, for instance, this 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 cloth that covers the the lectern on the on the teba it still is used and well, following certain rules of uh, when which uh, cover has to be used they're still changing the covers every time uh, needed so it's not a dead collection uh, even now it's still a collection in use everything is still being used according to the rules and if you go there, um, uh, and I can I can invite you to go. And if you go there, I, I would all, I would would almost say uh, give me a ring, so I can give you a small tour through the building itself. Um, it's still it, it's it, it's partially a museum, but it's still the whole complex still has the atmosphere of, um, and also still is still in use as uh, as the heart of the Portuguese Sephardi community in Amsterdam. And it still houses the oldest still functioning library in the world from 1636. 
um, it's Chaim, um, the most beautiful, gorgeous museum with the most wonderful books with Maimonides and everything. It's a it's a wonderful historical sensation to have this building, which is in itself almost completely kept from the 17th century, but still has all its contents in 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 artifact, but even has the books which were used at the at the um, at the at the school. So this is my small tour of the Amsterdam situation, and I hope, I, I, I guess, I hope um, I made clear to you that this this Amsterdam situation is 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 filled with uh, historical references to to both Judaism but also to high culture, high European culture of the best quality things, um, and it also may help you understand better the quality of the architecture of Tour Synagogue. A lovely building, as I said before, but if you compare this architecture of, of 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 the synagogue, this facade, with the temple reconstruction, which I show you on the right, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some links and connection between ideas about the temple of Solomon and the construction of your synagogue. Um, so, in a way, I think the tour synagogue is very much. Uh, um, as a, a daughter of of the Amsterdam synagogue, both in its, in, both in it in in its in its um, in its religion as in its uh, thinking about architecture. That's it for me. Thank Great. you very much for your attention. So Emily, if you can, um, uh, Peter, if you could, um, yep. uh, if you could. Uh, stop your screen share there we go that was spectacular that was just a wonderful presentation and and um brought home the the uh yeah you're getting you're getting lots of great comments um uh laura friedman the the president of the foundation says once again a great presentation we learned a lot and are eager to get back to amsterdam especially with peter's invitation so you you better watch out. We we may be, we may be coming. No uh, problem. So it was it was just wonderful and did exactly what we wanted. Shed a light on on the connection between Amsterdam and Newport, between the architecture and the practice and the um, you know uh, the, the the biblical references inherent in the in the building. Just terrific. We've had quite a few. Um, uh, um, I'm just looking at the uh, looking at the some of the other questions that have come in. Let me deal with some of these. Um, uh, we had a question about about the floors, about wooden floors, and about um, I, I I know that there are still wooden floors in the Esnogan today. Is that right? And was, were there ever? Is there sand put on them now? And were they ever just sand? Um, the wooden floors are, um, well, not original, but they always have been wooden floors in the synagogue. Uh, and they were covered with sand since a long time, uh, just comparable to the, the, the synagogue in uh, Curaçao as well, which still has a sand. Um, they did reduce the amount of sand, though, a little bit um because they think it might be a bit abrasive and 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 damage the wooden floors but the present wooden floors are from the 1950s um but it, it always had uh wooden it always had these wooden floors and below the the, the synagogue there's this enormous structure of um vaults but there were not, was never a stone a stone floor and there was never just sand so there's always been both yes I, I once gave a gave a talk at Turo um, titled "Tents in the Wilderness: uh, The Economic and Cultural Mobility of the of the Sephardic Jews," and and that that ties in completely this this notion that they were still in the wilderness in a way. Um, 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 well, I have, to, I have to say about that. I'm I'm not completely sure about that because our uh, cafes or bars uh, in Holland used to have sand on the floor as well. <laughs> so it, it, it takes up the dirt very well. Right. Yeah. So it, it might have a double meaning, but right. it's, it's it's the two of them maybe. Yes, that's right. Most 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 symbols like that in the material cultural world are multi vocal. Right. 
one other question that that was uh, quite interesting um, is um, where were these collections of, of fine objects that you showed us kept during World War II? Well, they were kept in the um, roof structure of the synagogue. And it's one of the amazing things of the synagogue that it is kept in such a great condition because the Ashkenazi synagogue was completely, demo well, not completely demolished, but ravished and, and the, the the joists were taken out, floors were taken out uh, by, the, by, by, by people just to have fire. Mm. Um, uh, the Portuguese synagogue was probably not damaged, well, not not at all. There, there, there were a small, few small losses, but in general, everything's still there. Probably because of the fact that the uh, the Dutch government had um, um, had put had put the synagogue under control of the um, uh, yeah, how do you say that um, um, the protection of valuable architecture. So that is service to, to protect for early work because they knew that the war was coming. They knew that already. And they had a special program to protect these uh, these buildings. Some of these buildings all had got a, a concrete roof structure in order to, to prevent uh, th that they would burn out if a bomb would fall on it. Uh, and, but the Portuguese Sunny Synagogue got the same kind of uh, status. And because of that, um, I think actually the, the Germans, when they came into Holland in the Second World War, they just took over uh, actually, they, they took all, over all the sets of rules which were present, and one of them was to keep this building in a, in a good state. Mm. So they, they just continued the law, which was not abandoned, and they kept protecting all these buildings. It's, um, it's, it's, it sounds very strange, maybe, but they were very, um, well, yeah, befelish, befelish, you have the rule, then you keep, you stick to the rule. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that is a fascinating irony. Um, um, one of the other questions uh, came up about the round windows. Um, and you, you mentioned that the Lutheran church was not allowed to have round windows. And, and so what is the, I mean, given that, given that, that uh, Toro Synagogue and, and the Snoga both have rounded windows, um, what was, why, why were round windows important to the authorities? Well, they, they have this uh, connotation of being sort of religious. So especially if, you, if you've got the pointy windows, the Orgeve windows, then it's even even worse. Uh, they, they had this idea that this is something special or religious-like. So the, 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 in general, the, the buildings were uh, had to be as simple as possible from the outside and not have any references to church architecture or synagogue architecture. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... We we had a, another question about the uh, the present congregation um, and the uses of the uh, the building for both religious and public. Are, the building is open for tours. Yep. And there's there's still an active congregation there. Yeah, they form parts. Of the The building is is a kind of sort of um, um, linked to the Jewish Historical Museum, which which, which is in the Ashkenazi synagogue. Um, and there's still a congregation in the Portuguese synagogue, and they have the the large synagogue, which in which uh, they go, they ha have the service in the summer, and they have the old school room in which they uh, go at winter, and there there is some heating, because it's really really cold in the in the synagogue in the winter. Yeah, that's good. Well, um, I th there there um, there's so much. So much to think about in, in your presentation today. Um, and we're just absolutely delighted that you're um that you were willing to, to be with us today. Um one of the things that I'd like to thinking forward to the last uh presentation in this season with with RISD Museum, we'll be looking at our great chandelier. And as we do that, I hope the folks that are with us from this program that join us for that program remember the chandeliers in the Asnoga. They're astonishing, they're brass, um, and, and it, that's another kind of object that connects us to, to Amsterdam as well. Yeah, so, so I can show you a small, um, well, I, I, I have a, an image still from the chandeliers and also the, the near Tamit on one of the, yes, if, yes. if you want me to show you. You want sure, me? Sure, yes, let's do that to, re to remind ourselves. 
So this is um at least I thought I had yeah. Can you see um I'm, uh, am I visible or yes. yes so what you see is the painting on the left and in the yes. middle you see one of these big chandeliers which is yes which were probably done by family of the architect which is funny they were uh, the cousins mm -hmm. and on on the right you see the near the the um, ah. um so you see the in the middle you see a chandelier and on the right you see the near and you see an enlargement of the near on the on the right wow that is that is wonderful. We'll remember that in March, the end of March. Our our program with the RISD Museum is 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 uh, as spring begins to come. So, well, Peter, thank you so much. I hope we can continue to stay in touch. Um, we'll extend an invitation to you as well. If you ever make it over here, um, please let us know, and we'd be happy to show you the synagogue and and show you Newport. So that that invitation stands open, please. Lovely, great. Yeah, terrific. I would love to, would love to see the synagogue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, just one of the um, uh, uh, there's a couple of last minute questions that have come in. We did have um, uh, members of the Curacao uh, community in tonight's in this afternoon's audience, and um, Renee David Levy Maduro says as one of the leaders of the curacao synagogue it was absolutely fascinating to participate in this webinar thank you huh. so we had a we had a we um we had a really nice uh wide reach uh of audience and and uh and uh that that helps again tie this community this pan-atlantic community together so good okay thank you very much uh well, there's a there's a uh Wait, wait. Uh, we just had a comment from a Judaic Judaica curator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, and he um, uh, she is thanking us very much for for this presentation. So um, th this has been so valuable to all of us. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye.